So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking the time to attend. It's my pleasure to actually introduce uh, Dr. Barry Horowitz from the University of Virginia, as well as Dr. Cody Fleming of Iowa State. They'll be presenting um, updates on their research for WRT 1022, Developmental Test and Evaluation, DT and E, and Cyber Attack Resilient Systems. With that, I'm gonna actually turn it over uh, to Dr. Uh, Barry Horowitz. So Barry, please take it away. Trying to get my camera on. Okay. Hello. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, an area of activity that's been going on for several years, namely resilience for cyber physical systems. And um, we have gotten to a point where it's uh, approaching a reality where we're going to have to test and evaluate designs of resilient physical systems. And so we have decided to mature our work to start to account for how one would test and evaluate such systems. The activity is just starting. We're working with the DT&E office at OSD and, 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 OSD, and um, we're just starting to make progress now. So with that, next slide, please. So our presentation is going to have two parts to it. The first part I will deal with, and that's what is this framework that we're talking about for dt and &E? and, uh, and then you will see that uh, we believe that uh, integrating the use of STPA SEC analysis, that safety related analysis uh, applied to cyber and to also apply model-based systems engineering uh, to the use of the framework. So Cody is going to talk about that, and then I'll conclude about how we're going to actually do the work. So I'll begin by just defining what we mean when we talk about cyber resilience. So we're talking about a successful cyber attack on a physical system in this case, and recognizing that this has occurred. And this implies a monitoring process for looking for anomalous circumstances. And then if one discovers such circumstances uh, that imply a cyber attack, uh, deciding what to do about it, which includes reconfiguring your system to a diverse way of operation, people doing what otherwise might be automated, different versions of automation taking on the role <coughs> of the attack system, and so on. And, uh, and as a result, be able to successfully continue operations. In addition, you do have that successful cyber attack. You have to deal with it. And uh, you also would like to send the information that you've collected to those who are dealing with how you fix up the system after the fact. So on to the next slide. So uh, a key aspect of our thinking relates to the uncertainties associated with cyber attacks. And um, you'll see that when there is a successful cyber attack, you have a lot of questions start to arise being told there's a successful cyber attack, namely, what are possible responses? And there could be many more than one. How much technical knowledge are the operational people required to have in order to make decisions? How rapidly do they have to do it? Uh, there may be no hint on that. Could be it's complementary to an oncoming physical attack, or it could be it's the end attack itself. Uh, how do you know that when you switch to this diverse mode of operation that it works? So how do you confirm? Uh, and so on. And uh, this list is a way of starting to expose all of the uncertainties associated with cyber attacks and response to them. And we'll have two ways that we can evaluate solutions. One is metrics based, uh, such as how long does it take you to reconfigure the system? The other is user confidence based. Uh, how does the operator feel about making the change? And is he confident that he's heading to a good place? Which could include the user running a test before he actually does a switch. Uh, so uh, both of these we feel are part of evaluation. Next slide. So the framework that I talk about has eight elements. Uh, it's meant to support 
the t &E efforts for how you go about doing the tests and converting those into evaluations. It builds on the use of tools such as hazard analysis, which uh, can be based on STPA, a safety-based uh, process that has many years under its belt. And it can build on model-based systems engineering, which is maturing as we speak. And uh, using uh, this framework, one can subdivide, subdivide test efforts into what we at this point think would be eight elements that uh, collectively contained all of the choices that people would have for what to do about design, test, and evaluation of a physical system. And hopefully ends up leading to better assurance regarding the quality of the test plans, the development and reuse of metrics for those parts of the evaluation that can be metric-based, and the, reu the reuse of test and evaluation tools from different projects to different projects to get better efficiency and reduce cost. So let me discuss the framework. So I say there are eight steps, and I say they, they hope to be universal. So how can that possibly be? Well, if you look at the eight steps, hopefully you won't have an immediate set of things, but a big part of our research will be to say, is it eight steps, and how many is it, and how are they subdivided? So the first step would be attack sensing uh, in a design. That is, how do I know that an attack has occurred? I can do data inconsistency checking. I can look at software execution corruption and many, 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 many other things. So we're not claiming we'll make the full list of the EGs, but we are saying attack sensing is a generic thing that can be built upon. A second part of the framework is attack isolation. Which part of my distributed system has been attacked? Is it the system control function? Is it the uh, situation awareness function? Which part? Uh, so that I know where to put my attention in terms of response. What are the resilience responses? They can be very many. Uh, you can just tell somebody and they can manually decide to do stuff. Uh, you can provide descriptions of different diverse redundant modes that are most pertinent given your view of sensing and isolation and uh, make those available to operators and so on. Uh, you can then ask how good is all this? The user could want to know how good is all this? And so here we can have uh, metrics that give an indication like what's the likelihood of a false alert uh, and so on. Uh, then you want to enhance the user's confidence in actually executing the results. And for example, the user can have a test trial of the resilient mode to be sure that it works. Uh, when working with UAV people, they said, well, let me do a, a two minute flight test to be sure I still have control of the vehicle after I switch to resilient mode. Uh, how do I know the operators are happy? Well, here we can get real time as well as post attack operator evaluation inputs to say what they were worried about, what they weren't sure about, what could be better, so that we have a way of gaining confidence with experience. Uh, how, who makes the decisions? Is it the command and control facility overseeing the physical system? Is it the operator group managing the physical system? Who is it? And is it automation? And um, so here we have to start to look at different ways that we might divide up decision making. And then post-event responses. Uh, who do I tell? How do I tell them? What do they do with it? How do I find out what they did with it? Do I have a chance to re respond if I was the operator who was involved in that situation? And so on. So these eight areas in surveying a broad set of researchers' work, we think is a good start at encapsulating different specifics, the things in the parentheses that people bring forward in a framework style. Next slide. So how would you use the framework? Uh, so uh, there are a number of steps here and they're divided into two areas. One that the program project office would do with the work support of the system development contractor. And the second, the project office would still be involved in but working with the dt and &E office. So the first step is make up a preliminary system design absent of any resilience features or special resilience features. 
Uh, second step is conduct an STPA security analysis. We'll hear from Cody about more about how one does that, which tells you what are the hazards that you care about and in what priority. Third is what are solutions that relate to your prioritization. And you want more solutions and more items in the priority list than you can afford, just in case you're going to later change your mind. So you want to have a, a rich set of options from which you do your uh, development of resilient solutions. Uh, and then fourth, you prioritize them in a manner that is understandable technically and operationally, and you document them as part of a model-based system engineering uh, mechanism uh, so that it stands the test of time through the life cycle of the system and across the broad set of people who will get engaged with model-based system engineering. It is not necessary to do that, but it would be greatly enhancing. In fact, my view is that STPA and MBSE reduced much of the uncertainty that comes with the inherent subject of cyber attacks. And we're living with enough uncertainty that we don't have to add our own in terms of how we analyze and how we uh, model and project solutions. Next slide. Okay, then to continue on, the fifth step of the process is what are your test concepts? Uh, what are the test scenarios? How many might there be? Uh, what is the ex expectation of what you hope to observe and the criteria for evaluation? Recognizing some of the evaluation criteria will be metrics-based, some will be confidence-oriented and not have as clear a set of metrics as we might have for other measurables. Uh, then using the framework, plan for the actual system level tests. So well, how will I test sensing? How will I test isolation? How will I test uh, diverse redundancy, et cetera? And then finally, having uh, done the uh, framework, how do I prioritize? Do the actual prioritization? And recognize that it may be you have a solution that intuitively you like better, but you have no reasonable way of evaluating it versus one that another solution, which intuitively you might not feel as strongly about, but you feel sufficiently strong that you could be convinced that with more substantial evaluation, you'd really prefer that solution than one that's less evaluated and therefore change your priorities and end up with a integrated solution set that is satisfying from both uh, your confidence based on experience and the actual uh, measurement that you're able to get. Next slide. Okay, so now for, Cody's gonna en enhance what I said as it relates to test and evaluation using STPA SEC and MBSE. So go ahead, Cody. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Let's, Let's see. see. You, you might have uh, gone on mute as well. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to, um, like Barry said, provide a little more detail on um, the how the safety community can have something to say about uh, resilience, cyber resilience, uh, as well as uh, test and evaluation. And then also talk about how we can integrate some of these methods, which are sort of agnostic to tools, uh, how we can actually integrate those and use uh, tool support as part of the engineering process. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to zoom out a little bit and say that, uh, you know, this could be a little confusing. Why are we talking about system safety? I thought we were talking about cyber resilience. Um, and then why are we talking about model-based systems engineering? I you know, I thought we were talking about tests and evaluation, and then we added safety. So um, to just sort of zoom out and talk about um, the, the general process a little bit more before we get into the details. So, you know, safety system safety is actually required to be part of test and evaluation in general. Um, so not necessarily just for cyber, but uh, generally part of the test and evaluation activities. And so for the DOD, MIL standard 882 is, um, is the way that it's done. And then there's a similar process for most other domains. Um, 
And a, a, a safety engineer would support risk management. Uh, and when we talk about risk, we're typically talking about hazard risk management, um, not necessarily programmatic, although that's also germane to this discussion. Um, and, and really, we're trying to identify hazards and eliminate those hazards, or in the case where we can't eliminate them, minimize the risk associated with them. And that becomes very interesting when we're talking about cyber attacks in the context of physical systems, right? So there are safety implications when we have um, a cyber attack on a physical system. And that's, that's really where uh, we started with this SDPA SEC work. Um, and then just as a side note, there's currently very little in the literature or in the guidance on cybersecurity uh, with, um, within the safety community. Uh, and that's not just in the DoD, that's everyone has this problem. And so we're uh, proposing an approach that sort of addresses this. Um, and so really this, uh, this part of the project is a focus, focused on hazard ID and then elimination or mitigation. Um, I'll go through this really quickly, but just to say that th this is just a little bit of an eye chart to show that um, that safety should be involved in the T and E strategy. So this is a requirement, right? So we're we're proposing methods um, that can address issues with cyber resilience, um, but that are already part of a required test and evaluation strategy at, at various phases. Um, and so, in the interest of time, I'll I'll go quickly through this one, um, but that that both, both prior to and after a test, we have to do um, basically what I said, hazard analysis, and then identify mitigation measures, um, both for the system itself as we envision it being operated, but also that we don't accidentally blow something or someone up during the test itself. Um, and okay, so with that context, uh, just, just to show that uh, we are indeed part of a, a standard t &E strategy, although with a potentially new problem, um, let's move into to the methods. And this is uh, somewhat of a graphical representation of, of what Barry already talked about uh, and what we call mission aware. And within mission aware, a, uh, what we call a cybersecurity requirements methodology. And you'll notice that one of the things about this method is, is not only um, sort of analytical approaches and tool support, but also bringing in the right people at the right time. And so this, this is color coded such that we have, you know, a systems engineering community or a group of people who are uh, involved in modeling and prioritizing solutions. So that's in yellow. In blue, we actually bring in the system owners, whether it's the, the system operators themselves or higher level people in the command and control structure. Um, we also bring in uh, security people, so people who do red teams. And then, so the, the, the boxes that are in yellow, uh, blue, and red were sort of what was historically mission aware up until this project. And now we're explicitly bringing in um, test and evaluation as part of our decision criteria. And so that's what you see over on the right. So we've augmented uh, this mission aware methodology with these uh, silver or gray boxes about um, tests and verification and whether um, our plan and our strategy is acceptable. And with that, we end up arriving at our uh, baseline system that we could go off and um, start to do operational tests or deploy into the field. Um, so just as a note, I, I mentioned this a little bit, but mission aware, the, the history now, I guess, of probably 10 years of history of research, I've been involved for five or six years, was really on design time assurance. So how do we actually design resilience into the system? And now we're pivoting, you know, in this project, it's been going on for two months now, um, is to really take these methods and transi uh, transition them into test planning and strategy for T&E. Um, so uh, similar methods, but shift in focus. And, um, and so, the method. Okay, so uh, we're finally at, at um, the method. So if we go back to, so when we do our operational ri risk assessment, this is step two, uh, what we're doing is actually um, what's called STPA. And STPA is a, is a hazard analysis technique um, originated out of MIT, uh, which is where I did my graduate work, um, that's intended to uh, improve or promote safety. And it's really based on the notion of, of 
controlling a process rather than preventing failures. Um, we still consider, you know, component failures, but we're really about uh, maintaining positive and safe control over the systems. And, and it's, so it's really a, a relevant topic for cyber physical systems. And we found that security can be treated analogous to safety up to a certain, up to a certain point, right? And so the, the method actually starts, so let's look at the right side of this chart at the words, the mes method actually starts top down from system level losses, which are something that um, is of value to the stake stakeholders. Um, and this could be you know, property damage or an aircraft crash or a whole loss, but it could also be a, a loss of sensitive information, right? So it's not just quote unquote accidents, but a loss of any kind. And then we proceed downward to identify hazards, which are system states um, in combination with environmental conditions that can lead to these worst case. Um, losses. And then we proceed downward to identify actions uh, that are unsafe. And those actions could be done by automation, uh, lower loop, uh, inner loop control systems, all the way up to operator actions, and even, you know, strategic level types of actions from uh, people sort of higher up in the command and control chain. And then the last step of STPA on the bottom is to identify loss scenarios. So things in the the, the controlled process itself, things in the, the sensing and the information that is presented to the controllers, um, actuation. Um, and so the, the method proceeds top down, but the graph on the left <clears throat> actually presents information bottom up, which is that we want to maintain traceability between um, lower level scenarios and whether they can actually lead to losses. And that actually helps us to um, put a finer point on where in the system we need to be concerned, right? And so this is agnostic to whether it's an act of God or a random event or uh, an adversarial action, right? Um, but by, by being able to focus in on those scenarios, we sort of can reduce the state space of places where we might need either hardening or resilience. Um, so that's STPA 101. Happy to talk more about that um, if you're interested. Um, but we're now, and, and STPA is, is agnostic to the kinds of tools. You could actually do it with pen and paper, um, but we're actually trying to encode this and endow this with tool support. And like Barry mentioned, we found that this helps us to scale. It helps us to um, engender reuse of, of modeling artifacts and reusing components, and it allows you know engineers to maximize uh, their resources. Um, we've actually, uh, been using what's called a system definition language or a, a, a meta model for model based systems engineering. And this comes from uh, Vitech Corporation, their Genesis tool. And, um, but it's not necessarily specific to their tool. It's, it's very copacetic with uh, SysML version 2.0. And the key is, uh, like SysML, if you're familiar with SysML, it can capture things like requirements, behavior, and architecture but also explicitly captures the notion of test and risks. So you'll see these gray um, boxes in the middle about verification requirements, test configuration, test activity. So that's a very nice thing in a meta model to have, um, to have sort of test objects that you can use and reuse. And so, uh, I realize if you're sitting at home on your laptop, this could be hard to see. So here's just a zoom in of the different types of elements that are in the in the meta model or the system definition language. And we've actually augmented um, Vitex meta model with our own notions of um, of safety, right? So everything you see in this sort of peach beige color is a uh, comes from SDPA SEC or mission aware in general. Right. So we reuse a lot of the same um, same objects and same types of relationships that you'd see in a Genesis tool or SysML 2.0. But now we have notions of, of hazardous actions, losses, mitigations, um, sentinels, attack patterns, um, basically all the things that I showed you in that six step process or five step process end up being um, encoded in the system definition language. Um, to support reusability and consistency. And as, as Barry mentioned, reducing the uncertainty in the modeling efforts.
Um, and again, here's a zoom in just for, for those of you who are on a, on a small laptop at home. Here's an example of uh, a zoom in on safety, security, and resilience measures, um, and an ontology basically of how we uh, how these um, elements should be captured in a model. Uh, and so the, the the tool itself will actually do a kind of uh, type checking to make sure that you have everything connected correctly and that you have everything modeled at least um, syntactically correct. Um, Okay, and one of the attractive things about the Vitech tool in particular, and uh, we understand in speaking with people uh, in the community and doing a little bit more research is that SysML 2.0 will have a similar notion and that we actually have uh, encoded in Genesis, Genesis um, test activities, verification events, test item classes, requirements and risk. And so we can reuse these notions as we get into um, developing test strategies and making assessments on whether um, you know the test is passed or whether we need to reiterate and um, go back into the design. And so here's an example of actual. Uh, it's it's not a unfortunately a, a real detailed engineering example, but here's a snapshot of 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 test activities and test configurations and how they will actually um, be formed by our choices of of our resilience measures and mode switching uh, as well as the types of loss scenarios that we're interested in right that, that are dictated by the user community or the the stakeholders uh, who are invested in these systems um, and so we'll end up um, barry will talk a little bit about how this research will proceed and how we'll actually use these uh, meta model artifacts uh, but we'll basically use these three types of details um, to to develop test plans and strategies uh, again, here's just a zoom in um, for the people to see a little bit better. Um, so we have test items that are uh, that trigger different test activities and specify inputs and outputs, and then provide the, the things that the metrics that we're actually going to evaluate when we do our test, right? And the nice thing about again doing model-based systems engineering is you get to reuse these artifacts and and get things that to scale better than just uh, pencil and paper. Um, so about to about to conclude here. Um, so there's there's two parts to this: is that we have a method that can be applied by anyone or any group of people, and this method can be done with with different tools, um, or different or, or no tools at all, just pencil and paper. Um, and it's just a step by step process uh, that is based in um, everything that Barry talked about with the resilience framework and this uh, notion of of STPA for security. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have uh, a tool development that is, isn't the Wild West. Yes, this is a this is a Vitech tool, but we want this to be copacetic with um, the newer developments in um, SysML 2.0. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Barry and go off screen here. Okay, uh, so how are we gonna do all this? Uh, our plan is, we, we first, we build on the work that we have done ourselves up to now and the associated uh, efforts to learn what others have been doing. Uh, and that's substantial, it's about 10 years worth of research that's gone to get us to the point where we've done a lot of design and evaluation work, but not in a formal manner as a dt &E would. Uh, Based on continuing view of what's going on in the research world uh, and documented from the operational world, uh, we can then start to say, okay, what, are, what is the framework? Is it the right framework? Does it include everything that needs to be included? Uh, how can we make people aware of what they should be providing to which steps in the framework? So, we could end up then with design patterns for systems that are reusable, reusable analysis techniques, test concepts that we're better prepared to follow through on, and metrics for how to evaluate. And uh, as a community, hopefully move more quickly and more efficiently than we otherwise would. Uh, 
our plan is to somewhere, let's say in the range of eight or nine months, uh, start to present the framework to members of the user community as it matures. And uh, we'll be presenting it to the DOD uh, community in a more regular manner. And we're setting up the relationships to do that right now as we speak. And, uh, and then at the end of the year, we'll look at a way to distribute the work in writing to uh, these communities at large. Uh, if we're ready, we can perhaps have a conference where we bring in people who are sufficiently interested to learn about what we've done. Uh, and we'll hopefully gain the support of the DT&E community and its sister communities who will be a necessary part of how one goes forward. And with that, I think we're ready to do questions. Uh, Cody, you have to take this back. So let me um, start by thanking you both um, for the presentation. We've got a couple of questions um, over here. There's um, two from Beth Wilson. If you wouldn't mind going back to slide number six, the question is, um, do you see, um, so it's good to elements of the T&E framework, but do you see these um, verifying cyber resilience requirements? If so, how do you get um, the T&E team to work with the requirements team to define these requirements? I think it's critical to do that. As I say, there's a lot of uncertainty in valid, not only validating them, but deciding what they are. Since many of them, we've done quite a bit of research with users, operational users, and uh, they have a lot of questions. I listed some in the slide that I had on the uncertainties. Uh, you know, how do I know what to do? How do I know it's right? I'm not a genius. I don't know about cyber. Uh, what do I do? And uh, and I think we have to have ways to evaluate that the system is as forceful as it can be in help in being helpful, and if not, modify it so that it is better. And so I think uh, a big part of the research will be how we do that and how we get the DT&E community earlier into the game. My own feeling it should be right after the initial design sans resilience is available. And they should participate in the discussion about what resilience design features seem viable, how they would work, how they would be tested and whether we could get sufficient evaluation that we'd be happy that we know what we're doing. Does that answer your question, Beth? Well, unfortunately she can't um, okay. respond directly, but we do have um, another question. If we can go over to uh, slide 16. So when you look at the lower level scenarios could affect a system um, level loss, do you also explore at how a group of scenarios affects potential higher level uh, system losses? Yeah, yeah, I can take that one. So yeah, that's a really good one. We, we actually, um, the, the answer is yes. And I'll try to give a short answer is a, a technical way of thinking about that is we look at the scenarios. Uh, we look at this whole thing as a graph basically. Um, Right. So there's connectivity between the scenarios themselves. Right. So like one scenario might cascade into another. Um, but it could also be that, uh, right, that, that like um, more than one scenario in concert actually has a different kind of higher level uh, effect. Right. And I think maybe that's what the question is. And the, the answer is yes. And we try to capture that. It's it's a tough it's easier to do qualitatively than it is to do sort of in a rigorous formal way. Um, but we've been looking at basically graph-based graph -based methods to do that. And another, this might not have been your question, but a, another interesting thing to, about, thing to think about when you're looking at cybersecurity is that uh, an adversary might be intentionally sort of burrowing his or her way into a system, right? Going, hopping from one component to another to another, in which case you would have these, this connectivity between scenarios that's explicit and on purpose. And that's another way to, or another reason for treating things as a graph. Uh, and we actually, 
we do our uh, so when we look at uh, our cyber vulnerability assessment, um, we actually do some automated um, cyber attack pattern generation that's also based on this connectivity between or groups of scenarios or connectivity of scenarios, if you will. So that was a long answer. The short answer is yes, we, we do explore that. And I see there's another, is there one other question? There actually is, yes. Um, this one, that last question came from uh, Giselle. This next one is uh, Beth. If we can go to slide 14, we've got um, the feedback loops are different from the other CSRM graphics and previous presentations. Um, is this change for DT&E? Is there an established form of CSRM that uh, we can be working from? Yeah, so that's a good question that I, I think um, I think the answer is yes and no. It's a mod, it's a modification. It certainly looks different than the original CSRM from last year, two years ago. But I, I would actually say that it's more of a refinement than a modification, right? Is the, the the original CSRM that's sort of four steps and has you know only one feedback loop instead of three is is very generic and can be tailored to different kinds of problems. And so I would say that the established form is probably the original one that you've seen before. And this is this is not um, so not different than, but more of a refinement of that CSRM, and specifically focused on a notion of access because original CSRM is about um, assessing risk and adapting your design accordingly. This is accepting risk and adapting not only your design, but adapting your uh, test patterns and your test strategy. So hopefully that answers your question. It's a little bit of a punt on the question, but I believe it's... Cody, can I add something to that? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I saw maybe a year ago, uh, it was on TV, so I don't know if it's true, but... Uh, Everything's true on TV. The, the DOD lawyer, chief lawyer, takes part in deciding how to respond to what could end up being legal sensitive topics for the DOD in uh -huh. terms of operational decision making. I was quite stunned by that. But it's a way of making clear that in an area like this, the participants can be have a very broad set of different accountabilities. All that matter. Some that might matter instantaneously, and some that might matter over a longer time frame, but nonetheless very significant. And so I think we'll be modifying the CSRM continuously as all of the accountabilities start to show up, some before we ship systems and some after we ship systems and learn from bad experiences. So I think that's sort of unavoidable when you're dealing with highly uncertain risks. Right. But it still has the same sort of flavor and the same yes. same groups of classes of people who need to be involved in. Yes. So similar questions, different answers. <laughs> right. Well, with that, actually, let me um, thank you both again uh, for uh, taking the time to present. And I also want to thank uh, Beth and Giselle for asking um, those questions. Um, I put something into the chat, but I want to actually express it as well. Um, right now, we're going into um, our afternoon. So our afternoon is going to have um, beginning with the network session, which I do encourage everybody to kind of um, join into as well. Um, and then also the afternoon uh, keynote, which has to do with um, the acquisition, the acquisition innovation uh, research center. That's going to be a brand new thing. Um, it'll be very, very interesting. And please come back again um, also. Um, to this particular talk, as you might have noticed, if you've been here from the beginning, they all kind of build on each other. So it's actually good, good to be in the track because you get a real whole picture of everything. And with that, thank you all again, and I'm going to see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.